Hello, my name is Omar Awana, and I'm an Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Today I'd like to delineate my approach to evaluating MRI examination of the wrists. And what I'd like to do initially is I'd like to start by looking at the coronal T1 weighted images. And I look here to look at the marrow to make sure that there's no you know, marrow proliferative or marrow replacing process. I look to make sure that the marrow within all the visualized osseous structures is nice and fatty and T1 hyper intense. If the signal intensity becomes iso intense or hypo intense or darker to the underlying skeletal muscle, that becomes a problem and that may reflect a marrow proliferative or marrow replacing process. Um, I look at the, you know, the radius, the ulna, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform bone right here, the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate, and then I look at the base of all five metacarpals to make sure that there's no marrow contusion or fracture. I also look at the lunate to make sure that there's no Kienbach's disease or avascular necrosis. That would be manifested as T1 hypo-intense signal and T2 hypo-intense signal if, it, if there's sclerosis and fragmentation. Again, Kienbach's disease can be associated with negative ulnar variants. Positive ulnar variants can be seen in ulnar lunate impaction syndrome where we get cystic change and chondral defects along the distal ulna, the lunate, and the triquetrum. Okay. I also want to just scrutinize the articular cartilage, which is this gray intermediate signal here, coating the cortex of the bones. The cortex is dark and hypo-intense, and this gray intermediate signal is the articular cartilage here. I'll turn to the T2 coronal fat sat weighted images to evaluate the marrow to make sure there's no marrow contusion or fracture, no subchondral marrow edema to suggest degenerative arthropathy. The most common places to get degenerative osteoarthritis in the wrist would be the first CMC joint right here and the triscaphy joint between the scaphoid, trapezium, and trapezoid. I don't see any uh, subchondral marrow edema here. There is some patchy cystic change within the lunate and uh, capitate and maybe the hamate that may be normal vessels or vasculature uh, versus small focal cartilaginous rests but overall the marrow signal intensity appears to be grossly preserved uh, you also want to look to see if there's any focal masses within the wrist the most common mass that we see within the wrist would be a ganglion cyst and this patient actually does have this small focal ganglion here along the dorsal aspect of the second to third uh, CMC or carpal metacarpal joint. These ganglion cysts are very common, especially in the wrist and hand, can be associated with the radioscaphoid joint as well, dorsally, uh, very common things to look for within the wrist. <clears throat> they can arise from joint, joint capsules, but they don't necessarily have to, the neck does not necessarily have to come from a joint. They can involve tendons, bursae, ligaments as well. Okay. Uh, the next thing I look for is to see if there's any joint effusions, make sure that, you know, there's no fluid descending the joints. There is some fluid here within the first CMC joint, but that can likely be physiologic, but there's no large uh, effusion descending any of the joints. And I'm looking at the distal radial ulnar joint, the radiocarpal joint, the intercarpal joints, and then all of the <coughs> CMC joints here. Okay. The next structure I want to evaluate very carefully is the TFCC or the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex. And it's this structure right here insinuating here between the distal radius medially and then the ulna here along the ulnar styloid. It's this biconcave disc or biconcave uh, hypo-intense structure that's attaching here along the articular cartilage of the distal radius. And then it has two slits that attach right here along the ulnar styloid. It should be nice dark and hypo-intense on all sequences, on T1, T2, protein density, whatever sequence you're looking at. It, it, it's kind of similar to the meniscus in the knee, where if you have increased signal that extends to the articular surface, uh, that can be consistent with a tear. So you're looking for T2 hyper-intense signal extending to the articular surface to suggest a tear. Okay, and um, you can have degenerative type tears, you can have traumatic type of tears, uh, but that's the TFCC, and the TFCC is a very complex structure. It's actually made up of eight different components, which we don't necessarily always see on an MR image, and those eight components are the central triangular fibrocartilaginous disc, which is this structure right here. Okay, you have the dorsal and the volar radio ulnar ligaments, which you can kind of see right here. Uh, you have the ulnolunate and ulnotriquetral ligaments, which are very difficult to see because it's not an arthrogram study. Okay, so that's the first five components. And then you have the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon subsheet. So this is the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon attaching to the base of the fifth metacarpal. This tendon subsheet is part of the part of the uh, 
triangular fiber cartilaginous complex, you have the meniscal homologue, which is this thickening of the joint capsule sort of right here adjacent to the prestyloid recess. And then finally, you have the ulnar collateral ligament, which is going to be difficult to see, which extends from the ulnar styloid to the triquetrum. So it's those eight structures that make up the TFCC proper, okay? And we're looking to see if there's any tear or perforation uh, of the TFCC. Now, there is some definitely intra-substance signal within the meniscus, which may reflect a degenerative type of tear. Some of this has T2, mildly hyperintense signal, so there may be a degenerative type of tear, but no large perforation that we're seeing here. I can see the radial attachment right here. I can see the ulnar attachment here with these two slits. If you're doing an arthrogram and you're uh, putting contrast in within the radiocarpal or radioscaphoid joint, any fluid that goes into the distal radial ulnar joint, if there's fluid extravasation to the distal radial ulnar joint, that suggests a tear or perforation of the TFCC. Okay, so that's the TFCC. And then I take a look at the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist, which are the scapholunate ligament right here and the lunatotriquetral ligament right here. Okay, the extrinsic ligaments are ligaments that connect either the radius or ulna to the carpus. <coughs> excuse me, such as the radiolunotriquetral, dorsal, radiocarpal, dorsal intercarpal ligaments. But the intrinsic ligaments, which are more important for stability, are the ones that connect carpal to carpal bone, such as the uh, scapholunate and lunatotriquetral ligaments. And the, both of these ligaments are made up of volar, central, and dorsal components. Okay, And if we start volarly, the ligament, this is a scaphoalunate ligament, it's usually trapezoidal. As we go centrally, it becomes triangular, like this, and then dorsally, it becomes band-like, like this, okay? And the same is true for the lunatotriquetral ligament. And you're looking for any tear or perforation within these ligaments. Notice that the scaphoalunate ligament is thickened. It has some intermediate signal, which can be normal. That can be a normal finding. But as we come centrally, there is some fluid signal within it, so I'm concerned that there may be a small partial tear of the scaphoalunate ligament here, okay? Um, scaphoalunate ligament tears can be associated with a dizzy or dorsal intercalated segment instability where you have dorsal tilt of the lunate and you have increased scaphoalunate angle. Um, they can be associated with other things as well, but that's one of the major things. It can be a result of carpal instability. Lunatotriquetral tears can be associated with visi or volar intercalated segment instability where there's volar tilt of the lunate and decreased scaphoalunate angle. And you do the same exercise as you did for the scaphoalunate ligament with the lunatotriquetral ligament. So you start volarly. And it should the, the ligament should be uh, trapezoidal, then it becomes triangular, and it becomes band-like. Okay. Uh, some authors have suggested that the dorsal component of the scaphoalunate ligament is more important for stability, and the volar component of the lunatotriquetral ligament is more important for stability. Okay. So you assess those ligaments because those are the two most important ligaments for carpal stability: the scaphoalunate and lunatotriquetral ligaments. Okay. I also tend to look at the sagittal view of the wrist just to assess the alignment of the lunate. So if I come here to the level of the third metacarpal, the lunate looks like it's articulating well with the radius and then the capitate is right above that. So you have the nice radial lunate, lunate capitate articulation here. Um, this is beautiful to look at that alignment. And I just take nice like to look at the muscles, make sure there's no T2 hyperintense edema here. Look at the marrow again and make sure that every I'm not missing a ganglion cyst that we already talked about. I look at that sagittal T1s as well, just to confirm the findings that I've already seen. This here is the PZ form. The PZ form is always a volar structure that can help you. This is the hook of the hamate, which the hook of the hamate is always a volar structure as well. If you have a fracture of the hook of the hamate, that can be seen in racket sports or golf. Uh, those type of players can get hook of the hamate fractures. Okay, and then I'm going to turn to the axial T2 fat sat weighted images, and I'm going to look at multiple structures here okay so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look here at the median nerve this this median nerve resides here within the carpal tunnel the median nerve can become enlarged there can be t2 hyperintense signal to, to suggest carpal tunnel syndrome this dark hypointense structure here that's outlining these volar flexor tendons that's the volar that's the flexor retinaculum there can be bowing of this volar or volar bowing of the flexor retinaculum, that can be a, a clue to carpal tunnel syndrome. But ultimately, carpal tunnel syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. We can suggest it by enlargement of the median nerve, T2 hyperintense signal, or volar bowing of this flexor retinaculum here, okay? This area here is Guyon's canal. This is where the ulnar nerve, artery, and vein run. There can be masses within Guyon's canal right here uh, that can impinge on the ulnar nerve. So it's important to look at the uh, Guyon's canal as well to make sure there's no masses there. You also want to assess the tendons. Volarly, which is right here, are all your flexor 
tendons, okay, and then dorsally are all your extensor tendons. The carpal tunnel consists of 10 structures. The carpal tunnel consists of the median nerve, four flexor digitorum superficialis tendons, which are right here, that go to the second through fifth digits, and then four flexor digitorum profundus tendons that also go to the uh, second through fifth digits, which are right here and deep to the flexor digitorum superficialis tendons. The last tendon that's part of the carpal tunnel is this tendon right here, which is a flexor pollicis longus tendon. This goes to the volar dorsal base of the first distal phalanx to the thumb. Okay. Interestingly, the flexor carpi radialis tendon that inserts right here onto the base of the second metacarpal, that is not part of the carpal tunnel. So this tendon right here, which is the flexor carpi radialis, is not part of the carpal tunnel. The other ten structures are. Okay, so these are the flexor tendons. You want to look to see if there's no to see if there's a, a tendon tear. They should be nice and hypo intense on all structures. You want to make sure there's no fluid around their tendon sheet to suggest tenosynovitis. These are the flexor tendons, and they all look to be intact. This is the flexor pollicis longus going to the thumb, and then these are the flexor tendons going to each digit. Flexor dig digitorum superficialis more superficially, flexor digitorum profundus deeper. The same is true for the third, fourth, and fifth digits. Flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus. Okay, if we come back here, I want to come here to the level of the wrist here. You're looking at the extensor compartments of the wrist, which are along the dorsal aspect of the wrist. There's six extensor compartments of the wrist here. Okay, this here, these two tendons here are the extensor compartment one. These two tendons are extensor compartment two. This third tendon is extensor compartment three. This is extensor compartment four. This is extensor compartment five, and then this is extensor compartment six. Notice that this bony protuberance, which is known as Lister's tubercle, separates extensor compartment tendons two from extensor compartment tendon three. Okay? This is the first extensor compartment tendon here. This is made up of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons. If you have tenosynovitis or thickening or tendinopathy of this compartment, that's known as Decor veins tenosynovitis. Okay? Extensor compartment tendon 2 is extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis. Extensor compartment tendon 3 is extensor pollicis longus. You can have a distal intersection syndrome where the third extensor compartment tendon crosses over the second, which happens right here. You can have tenosynovitis of the extensor third and second extensor compartment tendons as the extensor pollicis longus goes to the thumb. That's known as an intersection syndrome. Okay, more proximally, you can have an intersection syndrome within the distal forearm between the second and first extensor compartments, but that's more at the level of the distal forearm, which we're not quite catching. We, we're almost catching it right here as the first compartment is crossing over the second compartment here and making its way to the level of the wrist here. Okay, the fourth extensor compartment is the extensor digitorum and extensor indices tendons. These, these group of tendons right here. The fifth compartment is extensor digiti minimi, and the sixth compartment is extensor carpi ulnaris. You can have tenosynovitis and tendinopathy here with subluxation in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis, so it's always important to look at the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon as well. Okay? Um, after you assess the attendants, make sure that they're intact, make sure there's no tenosynovitis. I tend to look at the muscles, okay? These muscles here make up the thenar muscles. These, it's three group of muscles, the abductor pollicis brevis, opponent's pollicis brevis, and uh, flexor pollicis brevis. These are the thenar muscles. These here are the hypothenar muscles. These are the abductor digiti minimi, opponent's digiti minimi, and flexor digiti minimi muscles here. Okay, so you want to make sure that the muscle bulk is preserved. There's no edema or atrophy within these muscles. And then these are the intrinsic muscles of the hands and the fingers. These are made up of the lumbrical muscles right here, and then the interossei muscles, the dorsal and the plantar interossei muscles right here. Okay. You want to make sure that there's no muscular bulk. The muscular bulk is maintained. There's no edema and no atrophy there as well. Okay, and then you can round that out by looking at the T1 weighted images. Make sure that there's no T1 hyperintense signal within any of these muscles to suggest atrophy. Okay, and notice that the muscle bulk here is essentially maintained. Okay, uh, one thing that you should also look at, which I forgot to mention, is always pay close attention to the ulnar styloid, which is right here. Because if you have erosive change there, that can be an early sign of rheumatoid arthritis. So that's one of the early earliest places you can get erosions in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so that essentially is my evaluation uh, when I look at the MRI examination of the wrist. Feel free to adopt whatever you would like from these, and thank you so much for your attention.